uh, tonight. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome my very good friend, uh, Professor Helwig Notby, uh, to Edinburgh to deliver her given lecture entitled Beyond Innovation, Temporalities, Reuse Emergence. Let me tell you a, few, a little bit about Helga. Uh, she was born in Vienna. She holds a PhD from, in sociology from Columbia and a doctorate in jurisprudence from the University of Vienna. Helga is Professor Emerita of Social Sciences of Science ETH at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and has held teaching and research posts in Vienna, Cambridge, Bielefeld, uh, Berlin and Paris. Uh, I know her through her work on the European Research Council. She's a founding member, served as the council's vice president from 2007 to 2010, where the council did very well. And then she was elected president, a post she held till December 2013. And I think I can you know, speak with confidence for the leadership of the uh, European academic community when we say that the European Research Council really blossomed uh, under Helga's strategic and wise leadership. She, she's made uh, massive uh, contributions. Uh, since demitting office as president uh, of the European Research Council, she was appointed chair of the European Research Area Council Forum Austria and advises the Austrian Minister on Science Policy Issues. Uh, she is, despite her calm appearance, an uh, immensely energetic person, prolific author, over 300 articles on social studies of science, uh, and she has edited and authored. She's associated with more than 25 books. So I'm quite proud of my portrait, 100 articles, 10 books. We're dealing with a serious business. We're dealing with a 300 article, 25 book person. Uh, another grade up. Uh, recent books include Naked Genes Reinventing the Human in the Molecular Age, um, MIT Press 2011, Insatiable Curiosity, Innovation and Fragile Future, again MIT Press. And she has a new book coming out in the autumn, The Coming of Uncertainty. Uh, she's lectured around the world, uh, she's a wonderful person to listen to, and it is just a great honour and pleasure uh, to ask her to address you. Please tell us. Good evening. It is a great delight for me to be here today. Edinburgh is known as one of the foremost posts for STS. And I remember I was visiting Edinburgh many, many years ago when STS just had its offices somewhere here around this place. So this brings back memories. And I'm delighted to see partly uh, STS um, <coughs> representatives also in the audience. Thank you, Tim, very much for the kind words. My work with the European Research Council was a very exciting period in my life. It meant building up something new, funding fundamental research, and doing this in a place where nobody believed this could be done, namely Brussels. So the topic of um, <clears throat> this evening's lecture is beyond uh, innovation, and I begin here with innovation happening right now, always in the present, and yet it is strongly entangled with our imagination of the future. On the one side, there is a past that maybe leads us to a super intelligent AI, to the point of singularity that uh, some people are speaking about when machines and superintelligence will take over what humans can do. And there are some people called transhumanists who even claim that we will soon defeat disease and even death. On the other side, you have the fear of stagnation. You have uh, the opinion that maybe uh, the big innovative age the 19th century with railroad, electricity, etc., is past and that not much is in store anymore because we are wasting our time with the wrong uh, innovation past. 
So what I want to do is to set out <clears throat> some thinking that goes beyond uh, innovation as a binary mindset. This or that, either or. And I want to do this in the three parts that Tim already mentioned. I want to speak about temporalities, um, reuse and emergence. Now, we have had some guides from the past. These are some major thinkers who have grappled with the phenomenon of innovation, even if only one of them ever used the term innovation. Karl Marx uh, was grappling with the fallout of the Industrial Revolution. He put his thoughts into a grand utopia that, as we all know, failed. But he also uh, put the experience of his time into some memorable phrases like, all that is solid melts in the air. The experience that nothing remains as it was and is deeply shaken up and disturbed. Max Weber, as you know, is one of the major thinkers about the origin of capitalism, which after all was a major Western innovation, even if some kind of capitalisms have existed before and now we have different varieties of capitalism around the world. And the person in, at, the, at the bottom may not be that if such a familiar face to you. He comes from my home country, Austria, Josef Schumpeter. And he was at his time, namely at the beginning of the 20th century, one of the very few economists who started to think and write about innovation. Schumpeter was also concerned about the bursts and disturbances that came with rapid capitalistic uh, developments. For some years, he was even finance minister in Austria, so he also went through some financial crisis. But he thought uh, that the evolution of capitalism with the disturbances can only be stemmed by what he called the new men and the new firms. The new men were the entrepreneurs, and the new firms were what he, these entrepreneurs invented, namely new organizational forms, including new ways of financing what they set out uh, to do. But Schumpeter also, his book, by the way, was translated into English, it was written in 1910, translated into English only in 1934. And uh, Schumpeter famously also coined the term of the creative uh, destruction of innovation. So where are we now? Everybody talks about innovation. We try to tell an entire young generation to become entrepreneurs. Universities everywhere try to encourage and to nurture a spirit of entrepreneurship. Venture capital is in short uh, demand. And we are also telling the young generation that failure is part of being an entrepreneur and they have to learn to fail and to fail better, to quote Samuel Beckett, although he mentioned, meant it in a different sense. But then there's also the gap between this ubiquitousness of the rhetoric of innovation that we hear from politicians. The EU speaks about the innovation union. The latest policy development at EU level is about big investments that should innovate us out of the present crisis. And then there's the reality. The Eurozone is still in some kind of recession. I know in this country everything is better. <laughs> but this is Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> and then there is this ongoing debate between secular innovation and secular stagnation. And there are people who have looked very seriously, especially at American uh, data, economic data, who claim that the US is riding on a slow-moving turtle, that uh, development in terms of economic growth is nowhere uh, as high as it should be, and that if you look back at the various industrial revolutions, the first one, the Industrial Revolution as we know it, 
Um, the second one, electricity, railroads, uh, etc., computers just fading out. And now we don't really know what we find ourselves in, is the view of those who are arguing that we may enter indeed a secular uh, stagnation. What is interesting is that the people who are looking at these data also claim that there are headwinds against innovation that come not from technology. Rather, they come from demographics, they come from social inequalities, they come from lack of sufficient access to education. In other words, there is a cluster of factors that are holding back societies in terms of innovation and technology alone is not able to get us out of it. So what is missing? As you heard from my last words, I think that innovation is much more than technological. We tend not to see that much of innovation has to do with social factors and that social innovation is all the more important the more technological innovation you want to have and the more you generate. You need the proper organizational forms to be able to embed in society what technology <coughs> has to offer. There's nothing new about vested interests fighting back. And then there is the question, can one, and if so, how far, program what is unprogrammable, namely uh, innovation. And uh, permit me just a brief uh, technical footnote here. Why has uh, this narrowing in terms of how we conceive innovation occurred? And there are people who have looked at the history of the concept of innovation, and they say this is due to the fact that we have changed the statistics and the way how we measure innovation. Innovation is difficult to measure, to define and measure. And before there was a time when people were looking how much do governments invest in R&D and this was taken as a proxy measure for innovation. Namely, you invest in scientific activities and something useful will come out of it. But then this was changed to measuring what happens in firms. And how do you measure it? You ask firms. And lo and behold, 80% of firms say we are innovating. Mm -hmm. So the target has shifted, the way of measurement has shifted. It's not the scientific activity that is primary anymore, but the commercial output. And I don't have to say much more in this country about social impact and output. So to go beyond this concept of innovation as we use it, as we know it, I first want to go into um, the temporal dimension of innovation that very often is not uh, much investigated and much considered. We need a perspective from high up Humanity has always innovated. It's not a modern phenomenon. It may have taken a very long time to innovate, but we have to keep this in mind. There are rivers of civilization with many tributaries coming from different directions, and they nourish us to this day. We also know, once you look at such a river and people come into the zooming in, regulation is needed. If you want to prevent flooding when you live near a river bank in order to keep <coughs> the river on track. But then <coughs> we are also um, very often caught in the white water of the moment. We have to paddle vigorously uh, to navigate to the next rock to stay afloat. So these are two different perspectives on innovation. A long-term view from high up that is very encompassing and the short-term view trying to stay afloat in the very near future. 
Another way of describing the long term and the short term is to speak <coughs> about incremental innovation and about radical innovation. This is an example of incremental innovation, even if it is built on some radical innovation that happened a long time ago. Continuous improvement has led to what you see. And just to give you another view of what I mean by radical innovation, and there could be many more examples, this happens to be the quantum device lab at ETH Zurich, my former academic home. And here, like in many other parts of the world, what these researchers are looking for is to use the various quantum effects. They use um, quantum electrodynamics, and they are looking after quantum sensing technologies. Can we get better way of quantum imaging uh, technology, of quantum simulation, and so on? And one of the goals of this kind of fundamental radical research is to arrive at a quantum computer. Now, <clears throat> this is something that is open, whether we get there. But when we get there, I would bet one thing is certain, it won't be what we expect. Because history of innovation and of technology teaches us also that very often the most difficult thing to predict is not so much the technology, it's the uses of technology. It's the human factor and the human creativity, what use will be made of it. So putting these two images side by side, the Apple Watch is an example of exploitation. I don't mean the Chinese workers working uh, to produce it. Um, and the Quantum Device Lab is an example of exploration. These are the terms that James March, an organizational sociologist, has been using describing what happens in firms. And every organization has to come up with some kind of trade-off between exploitation, getting the returns that are certain, and exploration, where you don't know what you get and you don't know when you get it. Exploitation is easier, it's easier to predict, it's quicker, the returns come in, you can make business plans and you can build on that, and exploration is a long journey into the unknown. You don't know when, you don't know where, we can only with confidence predict after 400 years of scientific activity that one day there will be something useful coming out of it. So everyone here in the room who is engaged in fundamental research knows what uh, I mean by this. But here's also a warning. If the trade-off tilts too much to the side of exploitation, at one point the gene pool of ideas will dry up and in the end, it is self-destructive. Let me take you back to a very different civilization, Great Angkor, Cambodia. You may have heard of it, or some of you in visiting the temples. But it's not so much the temples. What is impressive is the water management system that this civilization had built. And in Angkor, there was the uh, refinement that went on over centuries of life at court. Uh, it was a flourishing court with 2,000 administrators, more than 600 dancers, and it took 70,000 farmers to feed uh, the court and to keep it functioning. But as you can see from this very impressive geometrical water management system, they were not prepared once the drought set in and climate change occurred. They were unable to change the pattern and they had no idea what to do. And this was the end <laughs> of Great Angkor as we know it. Was the innovation before 1750? Economists tend to say no. This seems to be the general view 
that everything started with the Industrial Revolution. But I don't agree. Look at these three examples here. The Magna Carta, it's a social innovation. It's a political innovation. It's happened some 800 years ago. And uh, it is still an important document. Look at the Gutenberg uh, Press which is due to the importance of small and middle-sized cities in Germany, but also in other parts. Germany in particular, uh, the city of Mainz is where Gutenberg worked. And uh, within a very short period of time, the printing press spread to a numerous other middle-sized cities. And as we know, it was an innovation a social innovation as well as a technical innovation because it enabled the printing of the Bible, the distribution of the Bible, it enabled people to read, but it also had very important um, impact on uh, science because for the first time scientific uh, findings could be drawn and printed and reproduced and they were much more exact than what you could do by hand drawings and just passing uh, it on. We also know little about the acceleration of the diffusion of innovation. Can you imagine a society where more people are connected to mobiles than they are to lose? It seems crazy that such two counterintuitive rates of social and technological change could happen side by side. But it happens in a country called India. According to the World Bank, there are some 71% of people living in India today who do not have access to, uh, sorry, the 71, yes, that, that have cell phones and there are 36% only that have access to what is called improved sanitation. And there are fancy categories in this improved sanitation and what it means. One is called VIP, and VIP stands for ventilated improved pit. So just that you can imagine what these figures stand for. At the moment, we have been able to uh, bring cell phones to 2 billion people in the world, in the developing world, but there are still 2 billion people who do not have access to a technology that has been invented a long time ago. So why is there this discrepancy? And who does the innovation and who is involved in spreading the innovation? One view is that by Mariana Mazzucato, who wrote about the entrepreneurial state. She has data in this book showing how much the government, in, it was mostly the American government, was involved in funding basic research that enabled Silicon Valley and their likes to do what they are now known for and uh, the kind of businesses that make an enormous profit now have, in her view, uh, been enabled by, uh, by the state. So from uh, just fixing markets to shaping markets to making markets is one conclusion that can be drawn. Now, I use the term acceleration and I think we all experience this enormous speeding up of technological development. It also has reached academic life in various forms. We are pressured for time. We know that, uh, especially for the young generation, you have to uh, conform to certain career patterns that all are accelerating when you are expected to reach which position and to deliver what. But there is another kind of acceleration going on 
And this is the acceleration of what we do to our natural environment and our resources. And pictures like these taken over time make this very clear that where once were glaciers, you now have lakes and similar things that are happening. And they are happening too, and this is another dimension, temporal dimension of innovation due to the unintended consequences of our action. We are not well equipped cognitively to foresee what will come out of what we do. We can have the best of intentions, yet we may end up with consequences that no one intended, that no one wanted, but uh, we have to uh, uh, live with it. This is the, the glacier came from Austria, but I have also a picture here from nearby, the Upper Clyde Shipbuilding Yard in Glasgow, 1931. Would, who could foresee what would happen after the Second uh, World War when the shipyards and the whole shipbuilding industry was very quickly demantled because uh, it was cheaper to build ships elsewhere, container industry came up, etc. So you had changes going on and in this particular place, this was very difficult to foresee. Innovation and the unintended consequences of innovation, in this case also a result of civil wars, wars, but also of environmental conditions deteriorating um, in the southern part of the hemisphere, can lead to innovation becoming mere risk management. And this was the title of a report that Mark Walpert, the chief scientific advisor of the UK government wrote with the title um, <coughs> innovation, uh, innovation manage, is managing risk, not avoiding it. So when innovations becomes risk management only, it means that you also are diverting a lot of effort, creativity into just managing risk. So to <clears throat> not to sum up as yet, I still have one very important dimension here, temporal dimension related to the future. The picture you see here is of a robot and this robot um, was programmed to be an ethical robot. Uh, this means it was programmed to ask certain questions that the program was considered to be ethical questions. And at one of these science festivals, the robot was shown to people around it what it could do, but it also encouraged uh, the audience to ask questions to the robot. And the idea was you ask a question for something that is ahead in the future. So one of the questions um, that the, the, the robot uh, was programmed to ask to the audience is, what words of comfort do you have for people in the future? And the answer came from a boy who said, we didn't have any idea what we were doing. We are really sorry. <laughs> so let me now come to the second part, the shock of the old. Uh, David Edgerton, a historian of technology, has written about technology in use, which means that you change the picture, the focus away from innovation and you see what is already there and how it is being used and reused, recombined, sometimes in very unexpected ways. Can you guess what this is? Garden grass. What? Uh, yes, you are near it. Yes, this is a garden roller. Mm -hmm. And this garden roller happens to be in use in <coughs> Rome in the garden of a monastery on Monte Celio. And as it is easy to see, it is a column of an old Roman temple that was precisely on Monte Celio, and someone ingeniously used uh, this column 
to make what the monastery needed for its garden, namely a garden roller. And it's a bit shocking, you think of a temple and a column, the profane mixing with uh, the sacred, but at the same time it's wonderfully practical and uh, creative. And more things than we believe can be combined in this and in other ways. Stephen Jones has written a book about um, six innovations that we all are very comfortable with. Glass, cold, sound, light, cleanliness and time. And he has retraced how these innovations came to be through ideas, technologies, people, partly gaps in time, but in the end coming together. And I just briefly want to focus on one, uh, on cold, ice. <coughs> Already the Romans were using ice at some of their uh, banquets, so they knew that ice blocks would keep longer, uh, keep the cold. But the amazing story is that in 1834, an entire lake from New England was put on a ship and sent to Rio de Janeiro. And this is an entrepreneur of a Schumpeterian kind by the name of Frederick Tudor, who thought in the tropics it's very humid and uh, wet and people should appreciate the ice that I'm sending uh, to them. But sometimes the sheer novelty of an object can make it hard to discern its utility. The people in the tropics, he first tried in the Caribbean, the people in the tropics had been used to their climate for a long time. They did not know what to do with the ice. And then finally uh, they got the idea and he got basically for free um, the ice. He discovered if you put sawdust, which was also very, very cheap, on top of the ice and in layers, it keeps longer. And he discovered that the ships coming back from the north to the south were largely empty because they were used to transport uh, merchandise from the south to the north. So here you can say a wonderful business case, but it took him a very long time to get going. And then the story develops, there was a doctor in Florida, we think of Florida as the paradise for American uh, pensioners, but in the 19th century it was a swamp with lots of mosquitoes, which meant that malaria was rampant. And a doctor thought, well, my poor patients, I have to find something to make them cooler in their feverish periods. So he invented a kind of air conditioning system. He made no penny on it, but the invention existed. And then the story goes on <coughs> to the multiple intervention uh, that happened, kitchen refrigeration, uh, flash freezing of food, etc to the kind of use of this uh, innovation that we now have in the life sciences without uh, the freezing of organs, organ transplantations would not be possible. Without uh, the freezing of embryos, many other things would not uh, be possible. Just to back up this story with a few data, the um, American, um, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has wonderful long-term data on their patents due to a new technology code. I will spare you the details. But in fact, one can go back to the year 1835 to the present. And what you see here is that it is the recombination and reuse that keep on growing, whereas origination, something that is truly new, is way below. You see this, if we just look at the last uh, 60 years, you can see the effect even more clearly. Refinement is what we do when these patents get to the US Patent and Trade Office. The novelty comes from combination 
and not so much from completely new ideas and technologies. Now, <clears throat> this is something curious that I still want to show here. Something happened in 1990. You see the reuse going up sharply. So what happened in 1990? I think what happened, and here in the room, many, I think, know the answer. Around that time, patenting, the number of patents, became an important indicator for the innovative activities of academic institutions and of research organizations. So if you press us hard, <coughs> patents can be delivered, but they will be patents that are built on refinement and reuse rather than venturing out into the uncertain. Are these similar processes? They look similar. They may have some similarity, but they don't rely on the same mechanism. If you refine candlelight, you will never, never arrive at a LED or at a laser. No way what you do. If you refine mail coaches, you would never have gotten a railroad. So this linear way of proceeding and improving does not get you very far. And this essentially sh tells us something about biological evolution and about technological evolution, or if you want, combinatorial uh, evolution. And the difference simply is that with technology, we are using previous technologies. We recombine them, but we have a certain purpose. There's a direction. We know why we want to use them. We know approximately where we want to go, which is not uh, the case for biological um, evolution that is blind in its uh, direction. I don't have much more time to go into differences of the mechanisms. And it's also <clears throat> easier to look at this picture. Nature combines all the time, but so do artists. And so I let, in this case, David Jablonowski, an artist who works in Amsterdam, uh, show you what combination uh, can actually achieve. Now, the last part is devoted to emergence. And here is Aphrodite. <clears throat> this, she comes, Aphrodite comes long before the more familiar picture of Venus, of Botticelli's, this beautiful Renaissance painting of Botticelli, of Venus arising from the sea. But the myth is the same, and the idea is the same. She represents an idea which is so difficult to, to show uh, with an image. Emergence is, in my view, not about a single invention, a single innovation, a single in a technology, nor about the plural, a cluster coming together, but a whole domain developing. It's an ecosystem of innovation, and this is why we also speak about ecosystems. In fundamental research, you do not find pre-existing scientific objects Rather, the scientific objects emerge in the way how scientists work in what Hans-Jörg Reinberger has called an experimental system, in the way how the idea and the practice, the crafting of planning the experiment, is related to the instrumentation that is available, to the techniques that are being used, but also to the whole infrastructure that enables this. This is emergence of domains. And if we think of domains today that are emerging, think of big data, an enormous domain, and the way how big data interact also with another uh, big emerging domain, namely what has become possible after genomic sequencing <coughs> has become widely available. And this combination of big data and genome sequencing is opening up another huge domain that is emerging. And the point is that we cannot predict 
in which direction this domain will further evolve. These are some of the reasons why I wrote the book that Tim mentioned, A Journey into the Unknown. And uh, in the book I argue that future is genuinely open and uncertain, that science is still the best way we have of bringing part of this future <coughs> into the present, and that we should not fear uncertainty. Fundamental research in particular is an inherently uncertain process. And science knows how to thrive at the cusp of uncertainty. If we can analyze, understand, and even embrace uncertainty, we become stronger and not weaker. And even if we expand the range of predictions in trying to make uncertainty less overwhelming, we are still facing limitations. We are moving in the realm of probabilities, or if you want, the probabilities of probability distributions. And uh, we meet inherent uh, limitations due to unintended consequences of our action. In a complex adaptive system, it is through the interaction of component parts that new properties arise, that new unintended consequences, if you speak about human action, will come up. So this cunning of uncertainty for me is a subversive force that pushes us further into the uh, unknown. And it prepares us, perhaps, for one of the few certainties that we have. The future will be different from what our wildest dreams imagine and what our most marvelous imaginations uh, make us believe. I want to end, however, with an epilogue. And the epilogue um, is about predictions the precariousness, the riskiness of predictions. Even if the posters did not get right the election, we still are very much obsessed with predictions. We want to know the future. We engage in foresight exercises of all kinds. So it may be worth at the very end to look back at a prediction that was made here in Madrid in 1930. It's the <coughs> Residencia de Estudiantes, which at that time was one of the most vibrant hubs of intellectual and scientific life in modernizing Spain in Madrid. And the person is probably familiar to you, John Maynard Keynes. He was invited to speak at the Residencia de Estudiantes, and he chose not what everyone expected him to speak about, namely about the Depression. Remember 1930, one year into the Depression. And he chose instead to put his gaze ahead of time. And his lecture was entitled The Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. And uh, he wanted to look 100 years ahead of time. So 2030. So we are in some way to assess you know, what got he right and what not. So what did he say, among many other things? He said <clears throat> the standard of living in what he called progressive economies, he limited his view basically to the developed world of his time, um, <clears throat> will be multiplied four to eight times. Now one can quarrel about details. But by and large, he got it right. Life expectancy and health will increase <coughs> dramatically. And uh, <clears throat> we know from demographers, life expectancy has exceeded what anyone could have predicted in 1930. But then he also says something that makes us laugh today. <laughs> the working day will evolve <coughs> towards an ideal of three hours per day. Why am I showing you this? Why am I taking you back to 1930? First of all, there is the timing. He's optimistic, despite what he 
went through the onset of the depression. He's optimistic because uh, he wants to have this long-term view. And he even says, among other things, the economic problem will not be the dominant problem in the future. So in a way, he is painting, which is very unusual for an economist today, a world in which it's not, the, not economics sorry, that will dominate. I'm showing this, first of all, because it reminds us the long-term view is a very different one from the short term. He's almost right. And where he's wrong, he may still be right, although for the wrong reasons. We are facing a major prospect of a reduction of work, not because we want to work less, but because of automatization taking over the middle uh, jobs uh, that are part of the economy and society as we know them today. So the jury is out on that one. But also, um, I was struck by the fact that how oblivious both Keynes and his audience were about what happened a few years later. 1936, the Residencia de Estudiantes was closed by the Franco regime. The civil <coughs> war broke out in Spain. Hitler had come to power in 1933. So there was something going on. A major storm of the past century was brewing and developing, and none of them were able to sense what was coming. But there is one more thing um, why um, this uh, may be uh, important. And this is, even if we don't know how the work, future of work will evolve, we know we face a major challenge ahead in the very near future. We don't know, and again, this is one of the unintended consequences of innovation. It's wonderful to have these robots. It's wonderful to have all the automated technology that will take over, but there are unintended consequences that go with it, and they will keep us busy answering questions like who will work, what kind of work, and how will work be distributed. The end <clears throat> takes us back to the beginning. Remember, innovation is not a straight path. To go beyond innovation means to go into the unknown. And I did not promise you a theory of innovation, although I think it would be good if we had one. I hope I've offered you some suggestions to help us understand where we are going and why. Innovation is an inherently uncertain process, but if we can live with the uncertainty, it will bring us rewards because the future is genuinely open. Thank you very much. Um, that was a really wonderful question, a really wonderful lecture. Uh, and now we have time uh, for about 15 minutes questions and then we will finish uh, then with the reception. When you're asking a question, uh, do, do please state clearly who you are and do please um, be relatively brief. There's one. Thank you. Martin Franzman from the School of Economics here at Edinburgh University. I was very interested to see that in the great figures you mentioned at the beginning was included Schumpeter, not surprisingly. As, as you know very well, Schumpeter defined innovation as new products and services, new processes and right. technologies, right. new forms of organization right. and new markets. And, and financing. And he talked a lot about credit and the importance of credit and innovation. You're right. Um, but he also referred a lot to what he called new combinations. Mm -hmm. 
And so my question, of course, uncertainty yeah. was crucial yeah. for Schulte. He understood that very well. So I guess my question is, are you suggesting that we need to go beyond Schumpeter? And if so, in what way? I think uh, looking back at Schumpeter's time, he was very much taken by what he saw. And these were the entrepreneurs. He did not see and the new forms of organization, mainly the corporation, but also other ways of organizing and financing was very important given his background also as finance minister. He kept uh, a big interest. I think we go beyond uh, Schumpeter in the sense that the entrepreneurs uh, today are not necessarily the entrepreneurs that he had in mind. And what I mean by that is in one uh, passage he speaks about the profit motive. So what is driving these entrepreneurs? And he says, of course, you know, they have to make profits. It's a very forceful uh, power. But he also says it's never the profit motive alone. There's something else. So he idealizes, if you want, uh, the figure of the entrepreneur in saying, you know, they... <laughs> Maybe you want to come in as well. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I, I think here there is, uh, it's, it's an idealization of, of the entrepreneur. And also the way how he describes it, as, 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 as you realize, he says, well, every entrepreneur creates these followers who are only imitating, and then um, he's constantly on the run, but eventually they will catch up, etc. So I think the picture has become much more differentiated. And also now um, something that played practically no role in Schumpeter's time is globalization. And uh, this means we have much more uh, entanglement uh, in terms of financing. You know, it's not just the banks of Germany and France and, and the UK. It's a global financial world in which uh, financing occurs then all these financial instruments that now are proliferating were inexistent at his time. So I think in, in, in a sense, you know, I would say he had great insights at a time when economists could not care less. They were in, in their neoclassical models uh, and looked at uh, technology as an external variable. So there was no interest. Um, but I think we have to uh, take into account the way how the world has changed, and it makes it much more complex. A question here. Edward Dunbar, School of Law. How do you distinguish innovation from invention? There is a, a distinction in the sense that um, innovation is the product that must be available on the market and be successful on the market. Invention, you have a good idea, you put it in, into practice. What I find fascinating is if you go, <coughs> uh, let me just see whether I can <coughs> go back uh, here. <coughs> here. This uh, book here speaks about six major innovations and these innovations are really clusters of inventions. So there are histories. I just told you very briefly what happened with, uh, with code, but you can go back to all of them. We recognize them as shaping our daily life. We recognize the latest uh, editions, but we also recognize it responds to some kind of need uh, and, and it uh, structures the way how, how we live. So what I want to say is the concept of innovation is taking over previous distinctions where you would say this is discovery, happens in science, then invention, you have engineers, et cetera, et cetera, also in terms of the people who do it. And then you have the business people you know, who take this to market. This is gone. 
there is a blurring of activities, there is a blurring <coughs> in terms of people who do what at what moment in time. So you have people who are innovators in this sense, who invent at the same time, who discover also. You have people who set up firms but who are firmly anchored in academic life. So there's the blurring that occurs and uh, you can still make a distinction for analytic purposes, but I'm struck with the way how the rhetoric of innovation is taking over everything. Question there. Uh, thank you, my name is Pat Cain, author of The Play Ethic. Um, one of the things beyond innovation uh, is the popular culture of popular cultural tropes of science fiction. I mean, in a sense, um, innovation being something tangible and practical, but the culture is constantly dreaming of radical innovations beyond radical innovations. Um, my question would be, what do you think is the relationship between a popular culture, which is very much defined by speculative fiction and science fiction, and the actual practice and possibilities of innovation itself. You know, the, the iPhone is the Star Trek yeah. tricorder yeah. or so forth and yeah. so on. Uh, is there a way that we, <clears throat> is a way that science fiction is enough? Or do we actually need to teach futuring uh, as, a, as a way of thinking and education? Do we have to have them more disciplined rather than a more as, as chaotic an imagination of the future as we actually have in, in contemporary popular culture? What, what uh, is happening is that, you know, science fiction is a great source of inspiration. <clears throat> And the people who are scientific fiction fans or film, films in, in addition to, to just reading, um, they are very much inspired by these ideas. I have recently been um, in a place where they uh, were holding a workshop between science fiction writers and engineers doing work in this particular university. Now, this was an interesting exercise, but it was far from what the organizers had expected. So there is no direct transfer that you can make. It's inspirational, you get new ideas. But if you ask me in terms of you know, future imaginaries, what is it we need? I am somewhat concerned that the amount of technological imaginaries that we have, and there are good reasons why this is much easier to um, come up with, it's easier to imagine, even if we are wrong about the impacts, you know, it leaves space. That this somehow is marginalizing imaginaries that I think are also at least as important, namely about a good society. What kind of society would we like to have? What is a good life? You know, what is our imagination of this old Greek question? You know, um, and somehow um, I think what would be needed is really to bring these two very different strands of imaginaries together, and to challenge people by whatever means. You know, think about societal imaginaries. Think about good life imaginaries, and try to match them in whatever combination you like with the technological imaginaries we have. There, please. <coughs> Colin Kerr, retired actuary. The um, situation with toilets in India, I believe, is an example of uh, cultural resistance. Uh, it, it's tempting to think that in the West we've risen above that that sort of constraint, uh, but perhaps we just can't see them. What do you think? Um, I have a very um, pragmatic uh, response. It may be wrong, you know. Uh, I've not seen any study of why there are uh, so many more people uh, having uh, cell phones. I think it also has to do also with the fact that the Indian government was much keener to provide cell phones to, uh, to its people than decent uh, sanitation. But <clears throat> this is, so I'm, I'm, I have not studied it, but this, this was my first reaction. Uh, in the West, are we free from that sort of constraint, cultural, like religious, religion? 
Look, I, I, I think, you know, improved sanitation is a human right almost, I would say. And, uh, you know, if the technology is available and there are cheap ways as well, you know, it is not so expensive. I think everything should be done to, to provide access, which does not mean that you don't have other needs that also people need access to. But I was just struck by this, you know, striking difference in, in a country where, and, and you saw this um, happy, um, happy person here, where is he? Sorry, <coughs> no, I think we can't have a conversation, I'm sorry. To the next question over here. <coughs> Uh, but do, do feel free to talk to Helga over the drinks. Yeah. Professor Novotny, you've <coughs> spoken about um, the difficulty of predicting innovation. Um, given, uh, if one goes back to Schumpeter's capitalism, socialism and democracy, mm -hmm. and then Willard F. Enterman's arguments that what succeeds that is global managerialism, how do you understand the relationship between the difficulty of projection and the governmental and governance predilection, direction towards the direction of society through managerialism, particularly in an ever progressive centralization of a society like that of Scotland? <laughs> Look, um, <clears throat> part <clears throat> of me is a realist, including a political realist. So I, I realize there are very strong forces that can indeed direct major developments uh, to go in one direction rather than in another direction, even if we would all agree this is more desirable or a greater priority. <coughs> On the other hand, <clears throat> and here I come back to, to my um, cunning of uncertainty, also these processes are not predetermined. They are, they may be past dependent, it may go on for a long time, but they are not predetermined. This is a firm conviction I have. And therefore, uh, <clears throat> even if we think now, you know, the world will be steamrolled by certain developments, I think uh, there is room for the unexpected and developments are not out late in a direct straight line. Question here. Thanks. Sorry, I'm Steve Yearley from the STS department. I, so I'm, I really want to go back to your title. So you know, mm -hmm. it, it's it's beyond innovation, and I I see that partly what you're saying is that we kind of we appear to have a fixation that innovation is the answer to lots of things, and you want to go beyond that fixation. Yeah. But I'm also wondering, do you want to go beyond um, the current conception of what innovation yes. is because <clears throat> I'm, I'm you know there's that um, reflection by Ben Martin about the way in which innovation mm -hmm. studies is itself sort of conservative because it has a, a certain notion of where mm. innovation is and what innovation right. amounts to mm. and what the sources yeah. of it are and his argument is almost that well we want social change rather more than mm -hmm. we want mm -hmm. innovation mm -hmm. so do you want to go beyond in that sense as well I want to go beyond in the first sense, in the second sense, in the third sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take Chair's privilege and ask the penultimate question. Um, you, you talked about the speed of technological and scientific change. Now, as a boring old computer scientist, I find myself increasingly, con con you know, my own domain contradicting mm -hmm. that. Thing. Recently at um, an event at Stanford, Strange in Opera, to celebrate Engelbart's about 50 years ago demonstration of the mouse, mm. the window, and video conferencing. And I subsequently talked to Alan Kay, who almost 50 years ago <clears throat> produced these very nice prototypes of what you would now describe as an iPad, mm -hmm. except that mm -hmm. the Gelsey iPad is impoverished uh, compared to, to his original <laughs> conception. Um, so you know, people come up to me and they say, oh my gosh, this is exciting. You know, the computers now do this. And I turn into this sort of boring old, oh, well, actually, I saw something a bit more powerful than that 30 years ago you know, in California or Edinburgh, but it's interesting they're selling it to you. I mean, do, you do, you think, do you think things are really moving that quickly? Certainly in my own domain, if you know that some principles of computer science, you, you are much less surprised. Um, <clears throat> insiders are less surprised, let's, let's put it that way. Mm. Um, on the other hand, if you think of Moore's law, mm -hmm. 
which uh, was <clears throat> perfectly followed for a number of years. Nevertheless, now, apparently, we are coming up uh, against some fundamental physics limits, which, you know, in the end may be overcome, but uh, right now we are encountering limits. So this is one answer. But the other answer, um, this is what I meant with this incremental innovation. And uh, what many people think is really lacking, namely, and this is close to my heart and to your heart just as well, we need to invest in fundamental research in order to lay the groundwork for things that will come 50 years from now. Yeah? And politicians are un able and unwilling to understand and accept this argument. Because 50 years, Alan, Alan Kay, I mean, we need to think about the Alan Kay 50 years from now. Exactly. That's pretty good. So there's a colleague there who's been very patient. Hi, Tom McEwen from Edinburgh Napier University. Our intellectual property laws uh, protect and reward innovation for a purpose. But what you're really talking about is designing for appropriation designing for people to do things that you don't know the purpose of. How can we reward designing for appropriation? I am not really into intellectual property right uh, debates, so I, I, I don't think I can answer your question. <clears throat> I, I think you know the arguments um, that, uh, is particularly in, in the life sciences, we have empirical data. If you patent too early, the life sciences working at the frontier turn away from it. So they stay away because they say now this is patented, you know, I would rather, so it is hindering the kind of innovation at this particular front that, uh, that you want. And I would not be surprised if this also happens in other areas. But with patenting and property rights, it's very much also specific to particular technologies or what it is you patent. So it's difficult to make a general statement. Okay, we have the last, last question here. The gentleman with the shirt. Michael Butter Burns, I have a kind of life work coach. Thanks for your talk. I wonder if you're familiar with uh, Edgar Schein, uh, Peter Senge, and Otto Sharma and uh, others like them in uh, MIT and Harvard who are using technology, the cutting edge of the technology, to promote and, and, and reach out uh, to, in a sense, educate the world, mm -hmm. but using things like deep listening, mindfulness, uh, sensing and, and learning from the past. I wonder if that's in keeping with what you're saying or is it out of, if you are familiar, is it out of step with what you're saying about uh, innovation? Well, look, uh, technology has many more uses than what we actually use it for. And uh, especially if you go back in, in time as, as you did, you know, at, at the very beginning of development, the world exists only of potentialities. <coughs> and then you have this gradual, you know, becoming more narrow and you have past dependencies setting in, etc. And in the end, you have something that sells on the market, but it is very often very far away from what it, uh, <clears throat> the potentiality it, it had. And uh, this is how things develop. But going back to the imaginaries, you know, we might do better and you know, stick in more imaginaries also as we go along and say, wait a moment, you know, there are other potentialities that we could use, but also bringing in many more users and let the users also come up with new uses, I think is a, is, is a good way to move on. So in the moment, I'm going to propose a vote of thanks. Before that, I should tell you that in common with many other of our wonderful Gifford events, uh, there will be a chance uh, for open discussion tomorrow in the chaplaincy and the team area uh, it will be led, that discussion will be led, as usual, by the Right Reverend Brian Smith, uh, former Bishop of Edinburgh, who is a, has wonderful gifts at facilitating um, such open discussions. So do, do feel very free, you're all most welcome uh, to join Brian for that discussion. Uh, coming to that lecture, where we were truly privileged, uh, Helga took on extremely broad canvas, 
She took on the nature of intellectual development, the nature of scientific discovery, the nature of technological development, and then related it uh, to a very sophisticated uh, view of innovation. Um, it was uh, very powerful. Um, there was quite a lot of tail pulling, as it were, the, the, the way that university, university heads uh, participate in the manufacture of data that makes their university look even more wonderful uh, was alluded to, I think, it was slightly too directly for comfort. Uh, but I don't, don't see any politicians in the audience. Uh, Contrarywise, the inability of politicians to understand anything beyond the life cycle of the electoral process and to appreciate uh, that it's, you know, serious invention, serious innovation takes place over tens and 20s and 50s of years, if it doesn't usually take place over five years. But that, that was very, very important, and it was delivered, uh, I thought, with, with great insight. I learned a lot from it, uh, generated extraordinarily good questions, love, and it was accompanied by lovely, lovely appropriate images, tremendously appropriate historical references, and an extremely, I, I'm going to say something terrible, I'm allowed to say this because I'm half German. It was delivered with a light and amusing touch, which is not normally associated uh, with the le leading I academics. Not German. <laughs> <laughs> German. <laughs> le leading academics in the German speaking world. <laughs> and so um, please join with me in applauding Helga for a magnificent.